Hello everybody, this is episode 16 of the Read the Source, Angular 2 Web Workers with Jason Teplitz. Along with us we have Patrick Stapleton and myself, Cornel Schiponake, and let's start this. Um, also what I want to mention is that you can use on Twitter the hashtag Read the Source in order to place any questions, if there are any, and we will try to address them to the, to the presenter. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us, Jason and Patrick. Let's start the presentation. All right. Uh, hi, I'm Jason. Uh, so what we're going to be talking about today is web workers in the Angular 2 code base. Uh, and I've talked about this uh, a little bit in the past. I did an Angular Connect presentation back in October. Uh, this isn't so much going to be geared to how to use web workers, but more, you know, how does how does Angular make it work, um, and sort of all of the fun advanced details that I kind of glossed over in that talk. So if you're interested in how to use them, I uh, definitely recommend going to the Angular Connect page uh, and finding that video, and then coming here to figure out how it actually works. Um, so just before we start, actually, I'm going to show a quick demo. Oh, let me share my screen. Um, here we go. A quick demo here of why you might want to use web workers. So in Angular, what we do with our web worker strategy is we've tried to extra abstract as much uh, of your code and logic as possible into the worker. And so the idea with that is we want to make sure that if you do anything computationally intensive, um, especially on slower or older devices or mobile devices, you don't block the main thread and you don't sort of cause a bad frame rate. So here is just you know, a rather contrived example that I think illustrates the point really well. Um, this is a very simple table. Uh, it has numbers on the left and their largest prime factor on the right. Uh, and as I scroll through the table, uh, I'm trying to add new rows to the table. This is an Angular 2 app. And what we'll see is as I scroll through pretty quickly, I can't scroll through. Um, and eventually Firefox freezes. I'm going to try and kill it before it knocks me off the Hangout. All right, that worked. Um, and so that's obviously not particularly ideal. That's not something we would want. Um, Luckily, we don't have to do it that way. So unfortunately, finding the largest prime factor is an empty hard problem. We haven't solved that. Uh, we can't actually do it any faster. But what we can do is we can do it in the background. And that way, as the user is scrolling through the table, we're at least not, um, you know, at least we're not going to block the main thread on them. And so they, will, they won't have any, oops, Am I running? And so this is the exact same Angular 2 app, but notice that as we scroll through, we sort of get these rows added to the table in a nice, gentle fashion. Firefox doesn't free. Yes, it still takes a long time for the rows to get added. It's still computationally intensive, but you can keep your UI responsive. And that's really the goal with web workers, is, is we want to be able to keep the UI responsive when we're doing any sort of task. OK. So now let's sort of get into a more detailed description of how this works. Um, I'm going to focus mostly on the messaging infrastructure in this. So the idea is, if you look at this slide, um, the idea is that we have the UI side and the worker side. And this is going to be true for all web worker applications. And we want to put as much stuff on the So traditionally, you know, everything is on the UI. You do your rendering there. You do your application logic there. and what we're trying to do instead is move that to the worker, and then we need something sort of in between. We need the worker to talk to the UI to tell it, you know, update this DOM element, um, tell me when this event occurs. So at its core, we have this idea of a message bus abstraction, and it sits on top of the post message API in JavaScript. And the idea with the message bus is that it sort of multiplexes this channel. It gives us a lot of different, a lot of different channels that we can communicate on. So for example, we have the renderer in Angular. Um, needs to communicate with the UI, and we want to keep that separate from messages about you know, events that may have occurred. So the message bus allows us to do that. It also plays really nicely with zones. Um, you want to make sure that you know, if an event fires on the UI, when you run worker code, uh, you're in the right zone. That's actually really important. Uh, if you're not in the right zone, then you'll run your event handler, and you'll change something. Change detection won't run, and your app is essentially frozen. Um, so that's the idea with the message bus. It's pretty low level. I'll go through the source code for it in a minute. But we also have this idea of a message broker. And this sort of sits on top of the message bus. And the idea here is message bus is nice. It gives us really low level control over the API. But what it doesn't do 
is it doesn't provide us with any sort of higher level abstractions. Uh, it turns out, as we were writing a lot of the web worker code, the, one of the most common things that we wanted to do is sort of this essentially RPC type thing where we had um, something sitting on the worker and it wanted to execute something on the UI and get the result back. And that pattern was so common that uh, we created the message broker, which abstracts this away. So you have a client message broker that sits on the side requesting the operation. This is typically the worker, but it doesn't have to be. Jason, and the so service message broker. Sorry for, for interrupting you. We cannot see your screen. Can you oh, please stop sharing? Um, uh, can you see it now? Uh, let me check. I don't know. Do you have the setting for the... For yeah, I see it now. You see it now? I guess when it went full screen. So just to show the slide from earlier, um, you have the UI and you have the worker, and they communicate with this message bus. Uh, and it uses post message in between. And you can see it multiplexes the communication into all these different channels. Uh, as for the message broker, uh, if we want to sort of perform an action on the other side of this runtime boundary, you know, maybe the client message broker sits on the worker and it wants to render an element on the DOM, uh, it'll make a request to the service message broker which sits on the side that actually does the work, in this case the UI, it'll say, hey, render this, you know, render this tag on the, on the DOM, and the service message broker will do that, and if there's any sort of result of that action, like maybe a success message, it'll send that back. Uh, that's the high-level overview, but this is called read the source, so let's get into the actual code for it. Um, okay, can you guys see this? Can you please increase this, the font? Yep. OK. A little bit more. Is this good? Uh, I think so. Yeah. Now it's visible. OK. Awesome. So this is the uh, message bus class that I was talking about earlier. This is actually the abstract definition of it. Uh, we have a couple of different concrete implementations, and I'll, I'll go through why in a couple of minutes. But the basic idea here is we have a class called message bus. You'll notice it implements uh, actually two interfaces, a message bus source and a message bus sync. Uh, and the idea there is you can, um, the source is where messages come from, and the sync is where messages go. So by allowing the message bus to implement both, we have this nice thing where you can say, just pass the sync to one, so maybe you have like you know one component that only needs to communicate with the other side, but doesn't need to hear back. And so you can just pass the sync to that component. And then there's no way for it to listen in on messages. Um, and that's actually really, really important because it allows this sort of separation of concerns. Um, we have a couple of different methods. The init channel is how you set up a new channel. So I showed on that slide earlier this idea of multiplexing. So if you ever want to set up a new channel, you know, maybe you have some service that needs to sit on both sides and communicate, you would set up a new channel for it. You give that channel a name. These are how the channels stay unique. Run in zone is um, uh, something interesting. So it's true by default, and at least in the message bus implementation that, that we've provided with Angular. And when it's true, you can see from the comment up here, that means that any events that execute will execute inside the Angular zone. So if an event comes over from the UI side to the worker side, uh, and, we've, and we run your event handler for you, if you initiated that channel with run in zone true, then we'll run that event handler inside the zone. If you set it to false, then we won't. So you can see true is kind of the uh, the default behavior. It's probably what you want. But it may be the case that you don't want the overhead of zones, and so we let you set that to false. Another reason that you might want to set it to false is that if run in zone is true, um, we do an optimization for you, and we buffer all your messages. So the idea is you know, you're running on the worker. You may have, uh, in one VM tick, you may have a couple of different things that execute, and they may all say, I want to send this message to the UI, and they're going to, you know, different messages, but they all want to send messages. And as it turns out in browsers, because you sort of have uh, this, actually, I don't know if browsers implement workers as a process or a thread, but either way, there's a communication overhead. And sending lots of messages, being very, very chatty, uh, is actually a horrible performance hit. And so, for example, when we initially did Web Worker Bootstrap, you know, there's a lot of chatter going back and forth in many different channels when you bootstrap an application. And just sending those messages in the order that we receive that that uh, the application wants to send them without buffering them in any way, uh, ended up being it was something like three times slower. I can't I can't quite remember, but it was it was a, a once we started buffering though, what would happen is we'll save up all of those messages that run in one VM tick, and then as soon as you exit, right? So as soon as you exit the zone we'll send them all at once. 
And the idea there is once you exit the zone, you can't possibly have any more messages until the next time you enter the zone. So at this point, we think it's safe to send all the messages. Um, attached to zone, that one's pretty obvious. It just set, you know, at some point, the message bus needs to get attached to a corresponding zone. From and to are how you actually interact with the channels. So they um, give you back event emitters, which are uh, observables. And basically, if you want to listen on a channel, you call from. And if you want to send to a channel, you call to. And then you use the corresponding event emitter to communicate with that channel. And you can see message bus source and message bus sync uh, are essentially just subsets of the message bus, right? Source only has from, and sync only has to. OK, so that's, the, uh, that's sort of the abstract implementation of the message bus. We actually provide two message buses with, um, actually three. We provide two stable message bus implementations with Angular. The first, the one that most of you will probably use if you use web workers, is this post message bus. So what's cool about the message bus is that it doesn't have to be just for web workers. So we've kind of created it as this way to communicate with the web worker. But if you think about the message bus implementation, it was actually a very generic implementation where you just want to communicate across some kind of boundary where you can't just share memory. So for example, uh, Rob Wormald, a uh, member of the core Angular team, actually created this uh, ng2 electron app. And what this does is it allows you to run Angular as an electron application. You can create different windows. You can do it all from Node. Uh, and what's cool here is he actually created a message bus. So he worked on top of this of this message bus abstraction, he created a different one for electrons. You can see it uses electrons. Um, um, I imagine somewhere in here he's using, yeah, he's using electrons IPC model. But the idea is the same, right? Because he created it on top of this message bus abstraction, uh, it actually wasn't a lot of work for him to do this because he just took this message bus and used it instead of the post message bus. So I'm not going to go through Rob's code because um, I don't, I don't really uh, know it all that well, but. I think it's kind of cool that we have this generic um, message bus implementation. And so you know, right now, we allow you to do it for web workers and Electron apps, but it doesn't have to stop there, right? Any sort of any place where you might have you know, two machines or two processes, and you want to run Angular, uh, different parts of Angular on both and communicate, uh, you can do that here. So this specific implementation, the post message bus that I'll show you now, is just for when you're working with web workers, and actually just for when you're working with web workers in JavaScript. Dart actually has its own, um, its own communication infrastructure, which I'll show uh, very briefly. So in the JavaScript implementation, we have a post message bus. Uh, the actual message bus, you know, this part, oh. this part here is not super uh, interesting because it, it pretty much just passes the buck onto the sync and the source. And this is kind of the idea. The post message bus is just sort of a wrapper over the sync and the source. And you can see we make sync and source public. So you can easily do something like you know, message bus.sync or message bus.source. Uh, and as I go through the code base, you'll see that everywhere. So let's go look at the sync. Uh, it keeps track of the zone that it's running in. Uh, it has a map of channels. And it has a message buffer. So if, I said, if you're running in the zone, we're going to buffer your messages. Attached to zone, this is pretty straightforward. Uh, you want to run the message bus attached to a specific zone. Uh, we call run outside Angular here. Run outside Angular basically means um, don't run this function in the zone. And the reason for that is that we're actually going to subscribe to a zone event here. And we don't want when, you know, zone of, on event done means that the zone event has ended. So you've exited the zone. Um, and we don't want to run your event done handler inside the zone, because then we'll immediately enter the zone again. And then we'll end up with this recursive situation, right? where every time we exit the zone, we enter the zone, and we actually never really exit the zone. Um, so that's why we call run outside Angular. Initializing a new channel, we really only need this so that we can set up the channel in the channel map um, and know if you want to run it in the zone or not. And then we set up uh, a new event emitter. And this is kind of strange. So the event emitter, um, we return it to you when you call to. So the idea is you're going to post, you're actually going to send messages to this event emitter, and the sync is actually listening to it. So whenever you send a message to the event emitter, we're going to grab that message, and then if you're running in the zone, we're going to buffer it, and if you're not, we're going to send it immediately. So two is pretty straightforward because it just takes that event emitter out of the, of the map and returns it, 
or throws an exception if you didn't set it up because we if you didn't set it up we can't create it for you because we don't know whether or not you want to run it in the zone. And then this is just how we send all the messages that have been buffered whenever you exit the zone. And you can see the actual send messages method here is it just calls post message. Okay, so post message source, uh, the message bus source, uh, this is how you listen. So as soon as it gets set up, we either add an event listener to the event target. So the event target is going to be the window, for example, if you're running on the UI. Um, or what's kind of weird is that if you're running in a web worker, the event target is actually just the global scope. I don't know why JavaScript works that way, but you actually can't pass the the global scope of the web, like the global web worker scope into this constructor. So if you don't pass in an event target, we just assume that you're working in a web worker and we listen on the global scope. Um, Init channel is basically the same thing as it was above, except that we don't subscribe to the event emitter this time because you're the one that subscribes to it, and we're the one who's going to send to it because this is the source. So in the from method, um, you know, you give us a channel name, we return the emitter. It's exactly the same as the sync. Handle messages. So if you look at what we did up above on, on line 91 and 94 here, um, whenever a message comes in, we call handle message. So handle messages. Handle messages. Um, like I said, messages are buffered on both the UI and the worker side. So we loop through every message that you sent us, and we handle each one individually. And that happens down here on line 125. And the idea there is we um, we make sure that the, the channel that it was sent on is actually a channel that we recognize. If it wasn't, we just kind of ignore it, um, assuming that the other side just you know kind of screwed up. Um, we grab the channel information. This is from our map. Uh, if we're running in the zone, then we make sure to enter the zone again before uh, we emit the event. If we're not running in the zone, we emit the event immediately. So you can see how this run in zone is really crucial because if you set your event emitted not in the zone and change detection is not going to run, and that's really bad and can sometimes be kind of annoying to debug. Um, and that's why we set it to true by default. So you have to consciously make that decision. So. Um, these are not particularly interesting. These are just some classes that help uh, provide typings to everything. Uh, this down here is actually just uh, because of our build process. We can't use the web worker d.ts file, so it doesn't actually know about post. TypeScript compiler doesn't know about post message. Um, so this is just kind of a compiler trick down here to get it to not emit an error. Uh, but that's the basic idea of the message bus. Are there any sort of questions about that, or should I move on to? I have one question. Is there yeah. any big difference between running it in a zone or without running it in a zone? <laughs> so um, a, is there any big difference in terms of what? I don't know, responsiveness, um, performance, um, yeah. memory consumption. So the, the trade-off is if you run in a zone, um, performance is generally much better, especially on Bootstrap. So what the zone does is it eliminates chatter by buffering messages together. That's the main reason that we do it. And that's actually really good because, uh, as I kind of mentioned earlier, the browser implementation of post message, whatever they're actually using in the browsers to communicate between these two processes or these two threads, I think different browsers do it differently. Um, but that sort of inner process communication is actually very slow. And there's a lot of overhead to it. It's a synchronous call. And so if you're constantly calling post message, right, you know, imagine that you have a series of calls to the renderer. This is actually super common. You, um, you know, imagine that you have an ng4 and you can loop over some data and create like 10 DOM elements. This is like a very, very common use case. And the way our renderer works is you're going to you're going to set up, you know, ng4 is going to see that your data changed at some point. It's going to run through its data structure again and it's going to generate all these new DOM elements. And, you know, for every sort of parent element, it's going to tell the renderer, "Hey, go create this DOM element." But, okay, so imagine that your data changed, you got 100 new elements, so you have 100 new data, like, you have 100 new things in your data collection. Uh, like I said, it was 10 DOM elements per, per data object, so that's now 1,000 DOM elements that you're creating. <laughs> you know, if you're going to do 1,000 calls to the renderer, I don't think it would actually be 1,000, but on the order of 1,000 calls to the renderer, you don't want to call post message 1,000 times because that's going to be really slow. What you want to do is buffer up all those messages into one very long array and call post message exactly once. And that's much faster because the overhead of sending a message 
uh, is much, much higher than the overhead of adding additional bytes to a message. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. So, okay. so Jason, uh, you said you, you mentioned that you buffer on you buffer on the web worker side. Have you like tried buffering on the UI side, or is there any like trade-offs, or is there a reason why um, you, you buffer everything before sending it down? No, totally. We buffer on both, actually. Um, I should have mentioned this. What's cool about this post message bus is that this is uh, this is shared between the UI and the workers. So this is actually the exact same code runs on the UI and the worker. Uh, I'm pretty sure we buffer on both. Uh, it kind of varies by channel. Uh, I'll go through the channels later, but not every channel buffers. But generally speaking, we're buffering on both sides. Cool. And um, I guess maybe you should probably explain it, but um, like you have to serialize the messages because you don't have shared memory. Yep. So I'll, I'll go through that in a minute. Um, the post message bus doesn't handle that. It just assumes that whatever you're sending uh, has already been serialized. So like I said, the message bus is super low level. So um, we but we have. Share screen. Oh. oh, really? Patrick, can you see Jason's screen? Um, not anymore. Hmm. It says I'm sharing. Let me let me try restarting it. I don't know why it's so finicky. Yeah, I see it now. I see it myself. <laughs> it's working. Okay. Um. Cool. So. Uh. Yeah. Sorry. What was your question? Oh, going over oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry, the serialization. Hello? Yeah. For for me it was right. just like going over the shared memory and serialization. Yep. Uh so we'll we'll get into that in a minute. But yeah, there's no shared memory between the worker and the UI. Uh which is why this this model also really works well for Electron, because there's no shared memory between uh two of Electron Windows. Um yeah, so I'll show the serializer in a second. Uh, first, I'm going to go to the message broker, which actually uses the serializer. Uh, or actually, really quickly, I don't want to go into this in detail because um, I don't really think people care a ton about, about Dart right now. But there, there is a different message bus implementation uh, for Dart, it's the isolate message bus. Um, this is just because Dart has a different API. So actually, the whole impetus for creating this message bus abstraction was because we um, we had TypeScript and Dart, and we needed to merge them somehow, and we didn't want to have to do different calls everywhere. So it's kind of funny that, you know, because Angular is written for both TypeScript and Dart, we actually ended up coming up with this much better solution that allowed us to create, use something generic. You know, if we had just done web workers for TypeScript, then we probably wouldn't have had a generic solution that worked for Electron. So I think it's pretty cool that because we had to write this for Dart, we ended up with something, like, even better. Um, the same thing happened to Zone.js, right? Like, it was... Like, it's built into the language for, for Dart, and you guys parted it over, essentially. Exactly, yeah. Zones are part of Dart. Fantastic idea. And I, I, I don't know, Mishko's pretty smart, so maybe he would have come up with it anyways. But I think that if it wasn't in Dart, we would have never thought of it. Um, and I know he presented it to the uh, to the, to the, to the, to the ECMAScript committee, so fingers crossed that zones will make their way into the language. Um... Okay, so this is the message broker. Um, this is what I was talking about earlier. It's sort of a higher level abstraction on top of the message bus. So the basic idea is this is the uh, this is the service message broker. So the service message broker um, is what actually receives messages. So actually, let's start with the client message broker. Uh, sorry to keep switching around. The client message broker. This typically sits on the worker, and what it does is it, you know, if you want to run a run some command on the UI, you call your client message broker, you say run this function, and it does it for you. So the way that works, we have this factory. Um, the reason that we use a factory is so that you can do it with DI. Uh, DI, the way it works in Angular 2, there's only ever one instance. Everything's a singleton, essentially. Um, so you inject the same thing twice, you get the same object, which is generally the desired behavior. For message brokers, it actually happens to not be the desired behavior, because if you have multiple channels, you want different brokers sitting on each channel. So the, uh, instead what you do is you inject a factory, and then after you inject the factory, you call create message broker for your specific channel. And so the idea here is that every service kind of creates its own message broker on its own channel. Uh, and I'll show, 
an example of that a bit later. Uh, down here is just the concrete implementation of the factory, uh, but it's pretty straightforward. The broker itself is kind of interesting. So you can see we, we have an abstract class for it here, and, and all we say is that you have to be able to call run on service, but the actual implementation is a bit more complicated. Um, so when you create a new client message broker, uh, we create a new, um, you're not calling it channel? Ah. When you create a new message broker, sorry, we do this in the factory, uh, we first initialize the channel for you. So you don't have to do that anymore if you're using the message broker. We then create a new client message broker for you, which sets up the, the sync. Uh, you can see the serializer. This is what Patrick was talking about earlier. I'll go through the source code for it in a minute. But the serializer is basically responsible for uh, taking care of that fact that there's, there's no shared memory between the UI and the worker. So if you want to send, say, you know, actually, if you want to send anything that's not just um, primitives or maps and arrays of primitives, you need to use, you need to serialize it in some way. So this serializer class is how we serialize Angular internal objects, um, things like compiler, templates, et cetera, uh, and also how we serialize DOM elements. That's the interesting part, because you cannot send a DOM element um, from the UI to the worker, and you can't even serialize them because they're generally circular. So uh, I'll explain how we do that in a little bit. That's kind of the, the magical part and kind of, kind of a hack, but it, it actually works really well. So um, when you call run on service, so this is when the worker wants to run something on the UI, um, for every argument, you know, we just make sure that um, you provided a, if you provided a type for the argument, we'll go ahead and serialize it for you. So the message broker really takes care of a lot of, a lot of these tricky details. It takes care of serializing. It takes care of running. It takes care of returning the result. Uh, we create a new promise. Uh, we then create a new unique string. So uh, if you look at this generate message ID method up here, everything that, um, every time on a specific channel that this, the, the message broker does something, it needs some unique identifier for it so that if it receives a result, it can map that back to your callback. Um, and here, what we're basically doing is just taking the name of the method you're calling, adding um, a timestamp, and then just in case we do this, iter this iteration loop, um, although I think it's pretty unlikely that you'll ever call the method twice in the same, in the same millisecond. But if you do, uh, we take care of that with the iteration to make sure that it's unique. Now, in the run on service, once we have, you know, once we've serialized all your arguments up here, we then run through. If you provided a return type, this is saying, hey, you know, this is a lot like RPC, actually. This is saying, hey, uh, call this on the UI. I'm, gonna, I'm telling you right now that it's going to return this type, which means that you need to create a promise for me, and you need to tell me that return, when that return value happens. So we create a new promise, um, and then we listen, um, we listen for a result from the UI. So create a new completer. Ah, we set it in our pending map. I'll explain what this is in a second. But basically, we create a new promise completer. We set it into our pending map. This, this is basically a private variable of the message broker that's saying, I'm waiting for responses from these IDs. And then we say, when that response comes in, OK, if you didn't give us a serializer, just return it. But if you did, deserialize it for you and give you the actual value. Um, and if you didn't provide a return type, we don't create a promise because we're not expecting anything back. Uh, we actually then create the message here. Uh, I have a little to-do still in here because um, uh, I've been meaning to clean up this code for a while. But the basic idea is we just say the method that you're calling and the arguments that you're calling it with. Uh, and then we add in the ID. Uh, I don't know why ID would ever be null. Oh, ID is null if you don't have a return type. If there's no return type, we don't need to send an ID because we're not expecting anything back. Uh, and then we emit that message. So the interesting part is down here in handle message. So this is where we use that pending map. So whenever we get a message back from the UI, um, uh, we do just basically some, some string equality here. And we say, is it a result or an error? And you can see I've been meaning to make this a little bit cleaner. But um, if it's not a result or an error, then it was probably not meant for the broker. You know, You could be reusing the channel uh, and doing your own communication on it. It's not recommended, but we don't want the broker to crash if you do it. So we check first. Um, we grab the ID, and you know, if we're waiting for a response from that ID, then we say, okay, is it a result? If it's a result, then resolve that promise that we stored in that map. Right? Remember, we stored those promise completers uh, as values associated with these ID keys in the map. So go ahead and get it and resolve it. And 
And so in this way, you can sort of listen if your UI call succeeded or didn't. And then remove it from the map, right? We've already seen, we only have ever received one response per call. That's just sort of agreed upon the protocol. Um, so now if we look at the service, I think it'll make more sense to look at the service message broker now. This is the thing that runs on the other side. So it does the same kind of factory thing. It sets up a new channel. It creates a new concrete implementation. Um, and then what's cool here is you call register method. So this is saying, hey, I'm waiting for the other side. I'm waiting for the worker to tell me to run this method. Here's the signature of the method, right? Here's the, the types that it takes. Uh, here's the actual method to call. And then if it returns something, here's the type that it returns. So you can serialize it for me. So uh, we keep track of a map of those messages, of those methods here. Um, and so what's interesting is this, this map is going to be from string to function, right? So what we're saying is uh, if a method is ever received with this name, just go ahead and call this function. So you can see down here in handle message, you know, if we get a message for a method that we, uh, that we know about, then go ahead and call that function inside of our methods map. So when that method gets called, so you, you know, the client message broker um, you know, called run on service, the message was sent across, it was serialized, it gets here, so we have a bunch of serialized arguments. Um, we create an array of them. We go through, we deserialize all of them. This is so using the same serializer class. I'll show it to you in a second. I know Patrick's uh, been waiting to see it. And um, we create a new promise. Um, this is kind of tricky. We basically want to run the method that you gave us, but with these arguments. So in JavaScript, you use apply here. Um, and we use function wrapper because in Dart, it's a little bit different. So this is a, this is a wrapper that takes care of the Dart and TypeScript things. And then if you give us a result, um, and if that result is, uh, is given back in the promise variable, then we go ahead and we call wrap worker promise. Wrap worker promise is down here. And basically what it does is taking that ID, right, taking that unique identifier of this method uh, and a promise which um, was returned by the thing that you called and a return type, then we wait for that promise to resolve, right? So just because that method return doesn't necessarily mean that the promise is already resolved. You might be doing asynchronous work on the UI. And then once that promise resolves, we go ahead and we serialize that based on the type that you gave us, and we send it back to the service, to the, sorry, to the client. Uh, that's the message broker. Uh, any questions before I move on to the serializer? I have one. Do you have yeah. any special event for progress, or we should, as a developer, as a user of the framework, should we, I don't know, create a new progress message result? Interesting. Uh, there's no concept of progress uh, in the message broker right now. Um, yeah, actually, I didn't think about that at all. It would kind of, it would require us to change things up a little bit. We'd have to move away from promises. It can only resolve once. So if we changed everything to use uh, observables, then yeah, we could do something like that where we keep like updating a progress. But there's no concept of that right now in the message broker. Oh, you should totally use observables. <laughs> that would be awesome. Yeah, that would be pretty cool. It's actually that's a good that's a, that's an interesting thought to go back and rewrite this with observables and then provide some sort of progress indication. Um, yeah, that's cool. But no, we never we never thought of that. Uh, anything else? Yeah. So, have you tried um, introducing like uh, web sockets, so communication with the server to the web worker and or client? Um, and have you also um, tried having more than one web worker. So say you have a random service and another web worker interact with, with the Angular application itself. Um, have you did any more of those crazy interactions yet? Um, so we haven't done anything with multiple workers. That's uh, that's something that I really do, I really want to try, but there's just so much stuff to do first. Like that's a that's a very complicated problem and I think that until we really um, have a lot of like solid support for web workers, have a lot of libraries that support it, have great documentation for it, have some examples of people using it. I don't think it really makes sense to sort of take on that monstrous task just yet. But it is yeah. something I want to eventually get to. Uh, the WebSocket stuff we do have, I won't get a chance to show it on this call, but um, if you go and look at my Angular Connect presentation, at the very end, I show this kind of multiple browsers uh, running in synchronization. And mm -hmm. that runs the Angular application actually on a local server and communicates with all the browsers via WebSockets. So what's cool there is you can run, you know, the same, you can go to the same URL on your tablet and your computer and your smartphone and interact with the application on any one of them and all of the applications update uh, at the same time, sort of synced up. 
So another question a lot of people are asking, like, have you tried uh, implementing server-side rendering and communication uh, through web workers, uh, rendering the Angular 2 application, then having preboot message uh, the Angular application with a web worker? Um, I mean, I'm not, I, I don't quite understand. So you've done in the universal starter pack, you have a web worker app in there, right? Yeah, well, someone, someone created an, uh, an example of uh, implementation. Um, I was just more or less um, wanting to go over, like, how it's, the, there's a separation, and there's uh, the view, where pretty much that preview is communicating with um, the view, and then that's relaying back to the, the web worker. Sorry, the, the view is communicating with the web worker? Yeah, so the, the, UI, the UI thread. Um, so what would it... What would it communicate that's different with server-side rendering than with not server-side rendering? Um, yeah, sorry, I, I was trying to get you the, the answer, but like, um, so a lot of people are confused on whether or not server-side rendering will work with with web workers, and um, with server-side rendering, it's it should be it's it's decoupled from it, so it's they work together mm -hmm. well, and with server-side rendering, you just render the the Angular application, and you have the initial DOM nodes there. And we also have this thing uh, called preboot, which yep. captures events and then replays it on the render view. So um, when Angular 2 kicks in, presumably you have the web worker uh, side wired up. Um, preboot's going to replay it on the uh, on your Angular, your client Angular application, and it so happens to be linked with a web worker. Um, and because it's replaying those events, it's going to go through all the message buffs and everything without any like uh, any other sort of complexity because it's just going mm -hmm. through the front. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so are you asking? Is there any chance? Is there any chance of like having preboot communicate directly with the worker and not replay those events, but just sort of send their serialized values? Um, no, I was I was kind of um, hoping you would answer the um, uh, the question rather than than, than me. It was. Um, just because a lot of people ask, like, can server rendering work with with web workers? Um, oh, I see. Sorry, I, I totally I totally misunderstood your question. You were just gonna, you were just asking if it worked. Um, and, yeah, and it does. For users, that's yeah. why. Yep. Oh, cool. Sorry, I thought you were asking like some some more. This is we're reading source code, so I thought you were asking something more yeah, about like, how would it work or something like that. Yeah. Um, my bad. Yeah, it, it does work. I think actually, we're um, the Angular mobile team is actually working on a demo application right now. Um, sort of based off of the work that you guys did with the Universal Starter Pack, fit that as well. Cool. Um, yeah. Okay. So I think there's still a couple, some like 20 minutes left. So maybe I'll I'll go through the serializer really quickly. Does that sound good? Yep. Yep. So the serializer. Um, this sits on both. This is also shared. So actually, everything I've showed you right now has been shared code. So shared code means it runs on either a web worker or a UI. Um, and we also have specific code for the, for the web worker and the UI. But everything right now has been shared. The serializer, uh, it actually started out very, very complex. But then as we sort of simplified the Angular compiler, it got much less complex. So basically, it actually only serializes a couple different types. So you call serialize um, with some object that you want to serialize, and you pass in some type. Uh, if it's an array, then we sort of just go through and iterate and, and serialize each one. If it's a primitive, we just immediately return. Because uh, you can send primitives across post message um, pretty easily uh, with you know with no issues, and otherwise we actually only support uh, three three different types now: uh, a render store object, a render component type, and a view encapsulation. So um, you'll notice these actually all do different things. The render store object uh, actually calls to some render store. The render component just serializes, and then the view encapsulation does this this enum thing. So let's actually look at the serialized render component type first. I think that's um, the most straightforward one. So this is sort of the general case of serialization, which is you just have some values. Um, we're going to take them. We're going to serialize each of them in turn. Um, you know, this one's a view encapsulation. This one's a primitive. Uh, we serialize each one, and then we return a map. And this map is something that can be sent over a web worker boundary. Uh, if you were working with you know web sockets or something, then in addition to using the serializer, you would want to call like JSON stringify on this map. But the serializer is really built for web workers, um, first and foremost. So that's the most simple thing, right? You just have a map, and you want to you know you want to send all of its values with its, with its keys as strings and its values as as primitives or serialized things. Um, 
there's, a, there's some more complicated examples. So you have an enum, right, say in a view encapsulation. So we have the serialized enum, um, which is pretty straightforward in TypeScript, actually. It just returns the value. So enums are different in TypeScript and Dart, which is why that we even have this method. So, you know, this is, this is serialized enum in TypeScript, um, but lang.dart is going to have uh, this val.index. So this is just kind of an inconsistency where in Dart, the value is not a number. The value is a, is a string, and we can't easily map that back. But in TypeScript, it is a number. So um, that's just a, a little thing we have to work around. The more interesting case, though, is this render store. So this is kind of what I was getting at as you can't serialize DOM elements. There's just no way to do it um, because they can be circular, because they rely on all sorts of classes that just don't exist in a web worker. So even if you could somehow serialize it, you would get that object back in the web worker and you couldn't deserialize it. So what we do instead is we have this notion of a render store. So if you have a render store object, so any sort of thing that might contain a DOM element as a render store object, and we go ahead and we use the render store. Um, where is that even defined? Uh, sorry, the file has changed a bit since the last time I looked at it. No, render store. So the render store basically um, sits on, you know, you have a render store on the UI and you have a render store on the worker. And what, you know, we can't serialize DOM elements and we can't get around that. And we just, we don't even try. But if you, if you think about it, you don't actually need the DOM element on the worker. You don't actually need any of its content. You just need to know which DOM element you're referring to, right? When the renderer says, hey, you know, change the text of this DOM element to this string, it doesn't need to know anything about where that DOM element is. It just needs to know that you want to change the text. Um, so we actually just, we serialize them all the numbers. So on the UI, when you call serialize, uh, you know, we call lookup by object. So, you know, you pass us some object that we can't serialize, and we go into this, this map that we have here, and we grab the number for it. So the first time that you do it, you have to store it in the map. So you call store. This gives us, you know, we set it, we have two maps so that we can go in both directions. So lookup by object and lookup by ID. So this makes it so, you know, if we have an ID for an object, we can get the object back. If we have an, ob if we have an object itself, we can get the ID. So that's serializing and deserializing. And then once we have these two maps, it's actually really easy to serialize and deserialize, right? We just, you know, given a number, we get the object back. And given an object, we get the number back. And, you know, as a result, it's super easy for the serializer. Uh, you know, when you say you want to store an object, when you say you want to serialize an object, then, you know, you just, um, you just pass the object, and you're going to get back a number. And when you want to deserialize it, you know, you just call deserialize. You pass it the... Um, that's at the map, which in this case is actually going to be a number because it was a render store object. And then it's going to go ahead and give you back the, the object itself. So that's actually super straightforward. It's really easy. The important thing is to remember to call store. So the serializer, um, as far as I remember, does not, yeah, does not call store for you. So you need to call store whenever you use the render store objects. And I think we'll see an example of that in a little bit. So that's the, uh, that's the serializer. It takes care of serializing everything except events. So are there any questions here, or should I move on to the event serializer? Not from my side. Nope. Cool. OK. So the event serializer, um, this one is, is a bit more hacky. But basically, you know, events are another example of something that we can't serialize um, because they contain DOM elements, because they, you know, they contain all sorts of stuff that we can't that we can't send over. Um, and we can't really do the nice thing that we do with DOM elements themselves. We can't just set serialize them to numbers because it turns out you actually need stuff from them, right? When an event fires, we can't just tell you, oh, the 56th event fired. Have fun. Like, you need to know what type of event it was. You need to know what the value of that node was. Um, you need to know, you know, where on the screen did the mouse event occur, all sorts of stuff like that. So we have a couple of different types of events. We have mouse events. We have keyboard events. Um, we have generic events. So every event in JavaScript has a type, a bubbles, and a cancelable property. Um, as far as I know, if you know of ones that don't, please let me know. But I'm pretty sure they all do. Um, and then this is a set of nodes. This is kind of um, an unfortunate solution right now. I, I want to come up with something better. But basically, any node that is, you know, any one of these nodes, whenever it fires an event, um, it has a value property. So we want to grab that value. Um, 
Then we just have a bunch of different types of serializations. We have serialized event with target. We have serialized mouse event, serialized keyboard event. They're all pretty straightforward. Um, event with target and add this target. So the, the target is if the node is one of our nodes that has a value, um, grab its target and then just store its target value. So um, like I said, this is kind of hacky. It's not, an, it's not a perfect solution. But when an event fires on the UI, if it fires on an input or a select or an option, and it has a value, then we want to send that value over to the worker so that you know if you're working with an input, you can see what the input's value was. Um, and we also do it for files if it happens to be something that has files. So if you're doing some sort of file upload, we support that. Uh, this is not super elegant. You can see I have all these to-dos in here. And basically, what I want to eventually do is allow users to supply custom event serializers. So if you're using a custom element and it fires a custom event, you know, it won't be in our nodes with values, you know, if it's like, you know, some other, some custom element. So we won't know to serialize it, the event properly. We won't know to add the value. Um, so we want some way for you to provide those serializers so that you can tell us what, what information you need and take care of it yourself. Um, but that's the basics of event serialization. Um, and, and then you'll notice that we have this event dispatcher class on the, on the UI. And what this does is it sort of just listens, you know, whenever you, you know, whenever you put something in your, um, and your template that looks like this, you know, something like that. Um, I think it's dollar sign event. You know, whatever it is. Uh, whenever you put in your template that looks like that, we need to listen for that event. So um, we have an event dispatcher, and it just listens on the on those event targets, and it listens for every type of event that we support, and it knows how to serial, you know, which serializer to call. What What um, about listening events? Yeah, so we don't support custom events with web workers right now. That's kind of the sad thing to, to do up here, support custom events. Um, so yeah, like I was saying, we want, to, we want some way for you to provide custom serializers so that you can support custom events, but we, don't, um, we haven't written up the design for that yet. One question. What happens if you're, yeah. trying, to, if you're trying to return a JSON object and that JSON object has inside of it cyclic uh, references? It has cyclic references. Uh, if you're trying to serialize it, like if you pass it to the serializer? Yeah. Um, so we don't have uh, what like JavaScript JSON serializer does with that. I think it actually just errors. But yes. we don't, uh, we, none of the things that we serialize are, cycli are cyclical except for the render store objects. So uh, none of our event objects are, are cyclical um, because we take out the DOM elements. And the things that are cyclical are those render store objects that I was showing earlier. And we don't actually send them across, right? We just send numbers. So we kind of just sidestep the whole problem and say, you know, we're not going to actually serialize any, uh, any cyclic uh, objects. OK. Cool. So this dispatch events. Um, yeah. So uh, now I guess. In just a couple of rem remaining minutes before any sort of q and I can just show an example of how you use all this stuff together. So we have the, the renderer uh, is kind of the perfect example. So no, that's not the right file. Um, so this is the worker renderer. So you know, Angular has this idea of a renderer. Uh, we have a render API, and we provide specific implementations of it for various um, various platforms. So for the web worker platform, um, you can see, you know, we have all these different methods. We have render component. We have uh, worker render here. Let's go through this one. We have render component. We have select root element. We have create element. And so what's cool about the render API, and this is kind of one of the genius things about Angular 2 um, that I can't take credit for. The team came up with this long before I was ever involved. Um, but they really split up the renderer from the rest of the, of the framework. And so from this sort of you know basic set of methods, create view root, create template anchor set of methods, you can build up any sort of complex rendering that you need to get done by just calling them in a specific order. So when you call one on a web worker, what we do is um, this allocate node right here. That's how we take care of that um, of that call to store. Remember how we needed to sort of put it in our store before we used it. Um, we take care of that right here so that those numbers and that mapping is all set up. So this is saying, I want to create an element. Um, so we actually create sort of a dummy element for you on the worker. This is just a number, but 
for all intents and purposes, it can be considered an element since whenever you want to do something on it, you just pass the uh, pass the number to us. Um, and then you call run on service. We say, hey, run on service, call create element, uh, serialize each of the arguments, right? So we provide the type to this fn arg class. Um, and we saw earlier that the because we provided the type, the client message broker will take care of serialization for us. And then, you know, we haven't actually created your element yet. This is kind of one of the cool things. Most of these render functions are synchronous. So Angular is assuming that when it calls create element, it immediately gets back the element. We can't do that on a web worker. It's not possible. But we can kind of fool, uh, fool everyone and just, and then it's as if the element was created, right? Because if you go to use that number later, you know, we've already sent this message, or it's at least earlier in the message buffer. So when it all runs on the UI, even though you may have said, you know, add this text to this element that doesn't exist yet, by the time those messages are processed, the element will exist, and that mapping will be set up properly. Uh, and so I think that's kind of a clever um, way to get around this, this synchronous asynchronous problem. Uh, and so you see, you know, it's essentially the same for all the methods here. Uh, anything that is creating is going to call allocate. Anything that's not isn't, and then it calls run on service. And then the flip side of this is the UI renderer. Um, and what this does is, uh, you know, it gets all these different private member variables. And then when you start it, so we have a place, I'll show you in the bootstrap, where we start all of these various things. Uh, it creates a new message broker, so this sets up the new channel. It initializes, uh, as an event channel is different. This is for handling events. But the renderer channel is what handles renderer stuff. And then it listens for each of those methods that I showed in the worker side. And it either, um, and it has specific implementations of each. So if we go down to render component, um, or create element is a good example. I just showed that earlier. You know, create element on the worker, we call allocate, and then we pass the, the stuff onto the, we pass all the properties of that element we want to create onto the UI. So on the worker side, create element, you know, we call create element on the actual worker, and then we immediately store the result in the render store. So that if you ever send us that number again, um, Oh, this is an important note. The render store's numbers are deterministic. So if you put in an, a set of elements x, y, z in that order um, on the worker, and then you put in that, you know, another set of elements x, y, z on the UI in the same order, they'll all have be serialized to the same number. So because we have this deterministic behavior, um, we can be guaranteed that by calling store here, we're going to set up the exact same mapping as we set up on the worker. And that's how everything um, Oh, sorry, actually, you can ignore that. That was in a different implementation. We actually just passed the element ID from the worker. So we use the element ID here to make sure we set up the correct mapping. Sorry for, for being misleading there. But yeah, the number that was created on the worker is passed to the UI, and then that mapping is set up properly um, because the messages might have arrived in a different order, I guess, or, or something like that. Um, but that's the basic idea with the renderer. We have a number of different things like this, and we actually start them all up on the, nope, Uh, sorry, let me find the right file. Um, I may not actually be able to find it here, but uh, at some point in the bootstrap process, we start everything up. Uh, Okay, it doesn't really matter, but uh, you can believe me that at some point we're gonna, you know, on these on this worker render, on this on this worker render, we're gonna call that start method on the UI and, and go ahead and get it started. Um, yeah, that's the that's the general overview of of all the code. Uh, are there any sort of any questions? Anything else you want me to go over? Not from my side. Let me see. No, sir. No. Okay. Anyway, that was impressive. <laughs> Thank you. Thank much. you. Um, yeah, totally. And there's so that that's sort of the general overview. Uh, if you're at all interested, if you look inside of, um, I have to share my screen again. Is there something that people can contribute with? Something. That yeah. So actually. There's a couple of things. So if you're if you're interested in you know if you're for your own use case, uh, let me get rid of this like showing everybody the call. Um, 
If you're interested in, you know, you want to create one of those components that uses the message broker for your own use case, uh, you can see all the examples for it are in the UI and the worker folder of um, Angular 2 source. So, you know, I showed the render, but we also have an XHR implementation. We also have an event dispatcher. And on the worker, we have the same things. And actually, um, if I, hold on. If I update the latest version of master, um, which I guess I haven't done in a while, uh, you'll see we actually also have a, uh, a router implementation. So um, for the Angular 2 router, you know, that needs to interact with the DOM. So that's a good example of taking sort of a, a non-core library and adding web worker support by adding these, uh, these two files. So if you have some other library and you want to add web worker support for it, um, this would be a great place to look and get started. Uh, in terms of other, you know, if you're looking to just contribute in general, if you have a really good solution to those, uh, the, that custom element problem that I was talking about, I'd love to hear it. Uh, if you have a good API uh, for uh, custom serializers, I'd love to hear it. Um, but also just, you know, there's tons of, any issue on GitHub marked as web worker, um, you know, is, is up there and they're all documented. So if you have any questions, you can, uh, you can hit me up on Twitter. I think my Twitter handle is attached to this somehow. Yep. Patrick? There is something else from from your side. I'm good. Hello, welcome. I'm gonna I'm gonna jump on Angular now, so okay. I'll catch you guys later. <laughs> All right. See yes. ya. Thanks for coming on, man. I'll talk to you later. Yeah, no, this was fun. Thanks for inviting me. Cool. Thank you very much, Jason. Uh, I will stop the broadcast right now. Thank you very much, Jason. Thank you everybody for joining us. See you next time. All right.